As you may have been able to work out from the title, what we're going to look at in this video is a thing called a reverse proxy. And that can be very useful in the sort of situation we've got with the example we've been looking at for the last few videos, where we've got a client, in our case a Blazor client, but it could really be any front end, and a server serving that up, but also we've got some data. So if we just take a look at the setup we had previously, we really just had these two applications, the client for Blazor and the server, but the server was doing two jobs. It was serving up the Blazor front end and also acting as an API so that the Blazor front end could then get hold of data that it was going to display. And what may well be a better architecture would be to separate out those two jobs. So what I've done in advance, because it's fairly simple stuff, didn't want to waste time, I've created a separate API project, and that is the one that just serves up the API data. It's then communicated to from the server, because the server needs the data when it's doing pre-rendering, if you remember from previous videos, but it's also communicated to from the client, which needs the data when we need it live. And so that's the setup we're going to have. And so if we just take a quick look at what I've done in the code, I've added in this API project that we've got there. I've also separated out this data project just so that we have the models, the author and the book in common. But in that API, if we just look at it, very simple, minimal API. So we've just got the endpoints for getting the books and getting the authors. Why do we want to do this? Well, there's a number of reasons, but really it's just a question of simple separation of concerns. Previously, we had one server doing the two jobs of providing the data and serving up the Blazor application. So it's better to split those off. And then the benefits we get from that, well, one is in terms of scalability. If we find that there's a lot of throughput for the API and not very much for serving up the Blazor, then you can scale up on the API without having to scale up on the Blazor and that will be more cost effective. Also other reasons, well, it may be that your API isn't actually part of your organization. It may be completely separate anyway, so you'd have to have it as a separate application. So that's why we've introduced this split to be an example of that. At the moment though, I haven't quite got it working because I haven't hooked up the two front ends to the new API. So if we run it up at the moment, what we'll see is that we're getting the front end there, but it's showing no data at all. And if we navigate away and come back, it's actually giving us an error. So remember that first one is when it was doing the pre-rendering and that one when it was actually going to the API, but neither of them are working. Very simple to fix that part of it though. So if we just go to the Blazor client and go to its program, and then in there, that's where we're trying to make the call back to our own server. So we just need to get the address that the API is running on, which is that one there, and just pop that in to what we've got there. And so that should work. And then for the pre-rendering, which is happening on the server, which we've got in here, well, at the moment, that's configured to use the local data service that just got the data locally. Now, though, because we've got to make an API call, we can actually reuse exactly the same code that we had here in the Blazor client because we want to go to the same place. So I can actually just copy that and then in the program here for the server, just replace that local data service with what we've got there. And so now when I run it up, then we can see we're getting the data there. That was the pre-rendered one. So that's the server making the call to the new API. But when we navigate away and come back, that's the client directly calling the API. So that's all making sense. What that means is we can do a bit of tidying up now. So we no longer need in the server, we don't need to have that dummy data anymore. So we can get rid of that. And also we don't need to have that local data service anymore. So we can get rid of that. And that should still be working because everything is now on the API. Just quickly got to get rid of that namespace because that's not there anymore, but that should now be working in the same way as we can see. And so that's all working pretty well, but actually there is a slight problem in the way that works. Because at the moment what we've got is the Blazor client is talking directly to the API, and then the server is talking directly to the API as well. And that can cause some problems. It can cause some problems simply in terms of configuration, because it means the Blazor client has to know where the API is, rather than leaving all of that knowledge just to the server. It can also cause problems in terms of security, because if this is a secured API and you're sending some kind of token with each request, well, that means the client has to have possession of that token to get to the API, which means more 
applications with the token and therefore there's a security risk. Whereas if we could get it for the client to talk back to its server and for only the server to talk to the API, then that would reduce that security risk. And also another problem we have is to do with same origin policy, where we've got the situation that the Blazor client can't automatically talk to the API because it's not from the same origin. And if we take a look at the API, you'll see that what I've had to do in there is actually introduce a very relaxed cross origin resource sharing policy so that the client is allowed in there. If we were to get rid of that, so get rid of that and down there, then we'll see that this application is going to stop working because when we run it up, we can see that initially that works because that, remember, is done on the pre-rendering and that was a call from the server to the API. But if we go away and come back, then you see we're getting an error. And if we take a look at that error and just drag that over, you can see it's a complaint that it's a cause error. The reason the initial load works fine is because, remember, you only get same origin issues if you're coming to the server from a browser. So browser to the API you have to have the cause policy. But from one server to another server, there's no issues about cause or anything like that. So that's why that one works, but the other one doesn't. But that's just another reason why we'd like to change the overall structure here so that the Blazor client still talks back to its server, and then the server will forward those requests to the API to get the data. Might slow things down a little bit, but it could have some big benefits as well. I'm not saying you always want to do this, but there's certainly a trade-off there that's worthwhile. So let's see how we could do that. It's pretty simple, really. All we need to do is in the server that we've got here, we've simply got to put in some forwarding so that when any of these requests come in, that we can see there on the API that are actually returning the data, we just want to forward those to the API. So in the program for the Blazor server, what we're going to do is introduce that mapping. And it's not going to return dummy data or anything like that. What we're going to do, actually, is use this API service, because remember, that is connecting back to the API. So if I just inject that into each of these and then change that to return API.getBooks and then similarly on the authors and change that to API.getAuthors, then that will simply forward the requests that come in. And then on the client, I'm going to take that and change it back to what it was so that it's now talking to its own server with that host environment base address. And so that should be doing everything that we want. And so if we now run that up, we can see that although we still haven't got any kind of cause policy, it should be working fine. And so there we're getting the data for the pre-rendering. But more importantly, if we go away and come back, there we're getting the data again. And we can see how that works. If we just go to here, let's put a break in the forwarding of get books and then put another break in the actual get books. And then if I click on the button there, there we're hitting the forwarding. And then if we go again, we're hitting the actual data. And so all of that's working. So fairly simple thing to do. And now we've got it that the Blazor client is only talking to one backend and that backend is talking to the API that's actually giving us the data. That said, although it looks OK, if you think about it, this code here is going to start getting very, very messy. Because in this simple application, I've only got one endpoint for books and one for authors. But you can imagine, even if this got slightly complex, you'd have at least five endpoints for each of those, because you'd have the get many, the get one, the put, the post, and the delete. And you'd need that for books and for authors and for each of your other data types, plus any other endpoints for more specific usage. And this code is going to get very, very monotonous, just hooking each one up one after the other. And if you forget one, it'll stop working. Very difficult to maintain. And that, at last, is where we get onto the idea of a reverse proxy. Because what a reverse proxy does in this sort of situation is simply allows automatic forwarding of requests that come into one server to get sent off to another one where our actual API is without you having to manually map each one of the corresponding endpoints. Now, there are lots of these available, but I'm going to use a very widely used one called YARP, Y-A-R-P. And as you can guess from anything in computing with an acronym that begins YA, that stands for yet another. So this is yet another reverse proxy. So we're going to put this in there. We're going to add it onto 
the blades are pre-rendering because that's remember where the forwarding is happening between the other two and so let's just pop that in go to NuGet packages and let's search for YARP and so there we've got it the YARP reverse proxy so let's add that in and then to get that working we've got to do a little bit of configuration so let's go to the app settings.json and go to the development app settings and what I'm going to do in here, well, firstly, I need to do the configuration for my regular API service because it's not very good to have that hard coded in there. So let's steal that. And then just in here, let's have a section called API. And then we'll put in there that address. And so let's just pop that in there. So instead of hard coding it, we're going to say builder.configuration and then get hold of that API. That's giving us a warning because it could possibly be a null reference. So we'll just do a double question mark and then we'll have throw new invalid operation exception and then API not in config. So that's just a bit of housekeeping there while we're in the app settings. But then the stuff we've got to put in for YARP, which is rather more complicated. So we're going to put in a section that we'll call reverse proxy. So call it what you like, but that's an obvious enough name for it. And then in there, we have to put a couple of things. Now, there's huge amounts of configuration you can do with YARP, and I'm just going to show you the simplest setup to get it working. But if you look in the documentation, you'll see lots of other stuff as well. But just to get it working, this is what we do. And you can see what it's showing us is it's got a root section and a cluster section. So we'll start by putting in the root section. We're only going to have one of those. And so what we put in here is we give the root a name. So let's call this API root. Call it what you like, but that's the one we've got in there. And then that will relate, as we can see, to a cluster. So again, give it the name API root API cluster. And then I'm going to do it slightly different from that. I'm going to have a match. And then in that match section, I'm going to have a path and that's going to be API slash, and then we'll just put in there star any. So that API we've got in there is corresponding to the fact that if we look at the endpoints in the API, then we can see they begin with API. So what we're basically saying with that, we've got there slash API slash books, and that will match slash API slash any. So we don't need to specify books and authors. We could have really precise routing if you want to do, but we're just saying anything that comes after API that's going to be worked like this, and that's the path we're going to have. So that's told us the root within the API itself, only one of them. And then we'll just close that root section. And then after that, we're going to add a cluster section. So we've only described the one cluster. We've got that API cluster, but that's what we're going to put in here. And let's just let the AI fill that in for us. So what you can see we've got, we've got the API cluster, so that's the name there corresponding to the cluster ID we put in there. Then we have our destinations. Then we can have a number of destinations, but we've got a named one here, just API destination. And then finally, we've got the address. And you can see that the AI has picked up the fact that we've already used the address there. So that's what we've got down here. So that's what we've set up. So we're basically saying if you find anything that matches slash API slash then use this route and forward it to the corresponding thing on 7108. So basically what's going to happen in the client, that in its API service here, for example, is going to make a call to slash API slash authors. That will be sent to the server, but then because it matches that, it'll be picked up by YARP and forwarded with the same slash API slash authors but to this new address. So that's what's going on in there. As I say, lots more config you can do, but that should get it started. We've then got to make use of that. So in here, we've now just got to do a couple of things. We're going to say builder.services. And then add reverse proxy. So this now has come in from the NuGet package that we had there. And then we've just got to say dot load from config. And then we just get hold of that section. So builder.configuration.get section. And then the name of the section that we just put in there, which you'll remember was the reverse proxy. So however much or little we put in there, that can then be loaded in. So that's configured our reverse proxy. We've then got to use our reverse proxy. So just down the end here somewhere. Typically, it can go in the same place where we had the manual forwarding. So we can get rid of all that manual forwarding now. And we just say app.map 
reverse proxy. And that will actually make use of it and introduce automatically all of those endpoints. We're just missing off a close bracket there. And so that should do the whole thing automatically, not just for the two endpoints that we had, but for any others that we have as well. So if we now run that up, and we can see the pre-rendering is working fine. That was never really an issue. The point is, though, if we go away and come back, we're still getting the data. And that's happened because we've gone through that reverse proxy. So if we take a look at the console, actually, for that one, there we can see that Yarp does some logging of that. So you can see things coming through. There was the API for books. There was the API for authors. So this, remember, is running on 7.1.3.5. So this is the actual server for the Blazor app, but it's forwarding to 7.1.0.8, which is the actual API. And again, if we put a breakpoint in the appropriate place, so on the API that we've got there, that's where we're actually getting some data. And so if we just bring up that and the console that we're looking at, so we can see them both side by side. And so if I go away again, come back, you could just see there that new message coming through that it's forwarding. And then we've hit the breakpoint. So that's all working fine. So quite a handy technique if you want to do this approach of channeling all your requests through the server that's serving up the Blazor application and have your API separate. It saves you a lot of typing. Obviously, you've got to do that bit of config. But after that, everything will happen automatically. So hope you enjoyed that one. We've largely finished what we needed to look at in terms of these various Blazor ideas and that sort of thing. But actually, we've kind of hit a slightly different problem because a lot of what I've been doing there is copying around things like URL. So we had to get hold of the launch settings here so that I know that the API is on 7.1.0.8. I also had to know things like the fact that the client was then going to be looking at its host environment base address. And as your application gets more and more complicated, that can get quite tricky to manage. And so what we're going to look at next time is something that came along with .NET 8, so it's been around for a little while now, but it's a thing called Aspire, which makes that sort of configuration of multiple different components of a web application much, much simpler to configure. So if you're interested in that, do click like, do subscribe, and come along next time to watch it.